Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast with me, your host, Laz Michaelides, and on the other end of your of the screen, your other host, Mr. Philippe Amorim. How are you doing, man? How you doing, man? Hello, everyone. Yeah, good, good to back. start another episode. Yeah, well, we took which, a bit of a... Which episode is this? This is episode 27. Can you believe it? We took a bit of a break. As anyone who follows our socials, you know, we took a little couple of weeks break uh, to celebrate our 3,000 episode downloads across 26 episodes, which I think is awesome. Um, what else was it? It was exactly a year to that day that we uploaded our first episode. So we thought, you know, we'll just we'll take a couple of weeks, reset, recharge. Felipe's been working his ass off gigging down in Soho. I've been busy with work and gigs as well. So it's just like, yeah, we we took a bit of time for ourselves, but we're back now and uh, ready to get rocking and rolling. Excuse the pun. But yeah, how are you doing? Are you good? Are you are you are you reset? Are you recharged? Are you you still Yeah, I'm feeling feeling okay, you know, after after the podcast break. Um it's good cuz um uh you know, I had time to to you know listen to some music and relax a little bit, but you know, gigging every night, literally seven nights a week, so it's really cool. And um, I'm, I want to start the episode not by cracking open a beer, but this time I've got sparkling water. Oh, <laughs> <Mr. Fizz>. oh <laughs> that wasn't too loud, but anyway, <laughs> I got. Enough. I'm, I'm sure the microphone picked it up, but yeah, anyway. It's, it's, happy, it's happy a healthier, healthier way to start the episode, not <laughs> not as as rock and roll as usual, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right, well, whilst Felipe downs his uh, sparkling water, I will introduce the, the band we're going to talk about today. And the band that we are talking about today are The Animals. Um, so a five-piece, gritty blues R&B outfit from England. Uh, they actually started in Newcastle, uh, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, if anyone wants to do the Google Maps. Um, started, wow, early 60s, like 63, wasn't it? That they 63, the, yeah. yeah you know mid 63 and they moved to london in 1964 yeah they did yeah um now the funny thing about this band is i tell you so i the, i started listening and knowing this band because of the famous song the house of the rising sun the song that everyone knows and associates with this band and i thought a band like this who release and, uh, I suppose, execute a song as stunningly as House of the Rising Sun, they've got to have done a shitload of stuff. They've got to have a big back catalogue. They've got to have had a big place in rock and roll history. But it turns out I struggled quite a lot to find anything on them. What, what about you? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? If you check, if you check their website... <laughs> Their own website, there's not much information about there it. There isn't, is there? <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you how I got to know the animals the first time I've heard about them. Go for it. Um, it was um, when I was watching a Dire Straits live album. Uh, I had a VHS. You're not old enough for that, Lars. Um, so yeah, well, you know, I used to watch The Lion King on VHS when I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so I was watching this... Um, uh, it's called Alchemy. It's a Dire Straits live album. And they are playing the intro of a song called Tunnel of Love. And Mark Knopfler is, is giving this kind of a short uh, introduction to the song. And he says, this song is about a place in Newcastle where I used to go to have fun. It's a place called Spanish City. And, you know, there's a live music venue, etc. And he's talking about going there you know, to have fun with his friends and, and girls and et cetera. And, so, and we used to come and see loads of good rock and roll bands, especially the animals. So he mentioned them. So, oh, the animals. So so, uh, so I was watching that thing. I, I, I had only, you know, a bunch of VHS and, and CDs and tapes and cassette tapes. And that's how I I was listening to my rock songs. And I had had no other, you know, that there was no YouTube or whatever, yeah. uh, so I've listened to that. I was watching that, and and I and I've heard about the animals, and I said I want to know who these guys, who those guys are, but had no no access to anything about them until I finally listened to uh, House of the Rising Sun on the radio, and so that's by the animals. 
And I said, oh, right. So that's the band that Mark Knopfler talked about. And it's interesting how they influenced all those, uh, you know, classic uh, uh, British rock bands. And they actually influenced some of their idols as well. Yeah, which is that, that's really interesting because the, the what I wanted to sort of start, you, you guys know, you know, our listeners, you know that when we talk about a band, we'll often dive down deep into their back catalogue, talk about their albums that were the most famous, talk about them. But I, I, I kind of want to take a bit of a different approach today. I just want to talk about some songs. So we've got an album here, which is called The Animals, The Singles Plus. And this is 20 of their greatest hits, supposedly. And it's spanning their, al- their, their different albums. Now, the thing to start off with, with The Animals, is that there was numerous lineup changes. And actually, they were only The Animals for three years. They became Eric Burdon and The Animals after Alan Price left. And then, uh, what was it, in 66, the drummer changed. In 66 the keyboard changed so there were, there were so many numerous lineup changes but the famous most original lineup is the ones from 63 to 66 and i think these singles encompass that lineup most um so we're going to put all 20 songs in that playlist for you because this really is a perfect summary of the animals um and i've been listening to it all week uh what about you felipe you've been listening yeah i've been listening for, for a few days and it's like uh it, it's amazing actually to because it gets, because there's some consistency in those songs that they sound like. Obviously, we're talking. If you're talking about you're talking about a compilation, yeah, is the best of kind of album. Uh, yeah, th- there's obviously all hits in there, but there's a consistency of quality over all those songs that they sound like they were all taken from one album. Yeah, it and does. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's just like amazing the, 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 I mean the sounds the tones of guitars and keyboards and they actually I think they were one of those bands that managed to stick to a formula you know they were not necessarily recreating themselves all the time but they had a really good way of arranging and performing songs so uh, I think it, it it's totally reasonable to stick to the formula when it's a good one is <laughs> yeah, no exactly yeah the- so I just want to say something. For, yeah, go for it. Those who don't know, the musicians are Eric Burden on vocals, Hilton Valentine on guitar, Alan Price on keyboards, Charles Chandler on bass, and John Steele on drums. Those are, you know, the main musicians, really. They're the guys who actually uh, were part of the classic lineup, the, the original lineup, and they recorded the first EP. Uh, they actually uh, released a four-track EP in autumn 63, so around that time, and that's how they started. And then the second release uh, was a live album with Sonny Boy Williamson, blues singer. Wow. So he was, yeah, it was The Animals and him. So uh, really? having them as, as, as a backing band, and 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 as, I think there was one set with just them. So that was, an interest, that was in 30th of December, 1963, they released that one, uh, or recorded that one. Uh, with Sony Boy, so it's 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 an interesting one because that shows the connection they had with uh, 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 traditional American blues. Well, th- this is sort of c- following on from what I was saying earlier. Before I asked you if you listened to the album, it's the reason going backtracking a bit. The reason why I want to just focus on these hits is because. The Animals are just such a varied band, aren't they? They're they're just... Check this out, okay? This is what I've done. So, like I said, I've been listening to this album all week, and I've taken notes on all of the songs. Don't worry, we're not necessarily going to talk about all of them. But what I did is I listed the songs, the names of the songs, and next to each song, I did the genre that I would associate it with. Or or maybe for a couple of songs, there was two genres. Now, here it is, okay? 20 songs, and this is the genre count, okay? Seven (laughs) blues songs, six rock and roll songs, five R&B songs, three gospel, two doo-wop, two Motown, and two rock, as we'll call it. So, like I said, there'll be some of those where I thought it was R&B and doo-wop, but so, you know, the math doesn't quite add up. but, But there was just such a variety of different styles and genres on this album and from this band that i just thought it was staggering how the, the the thing is is you can you can do that you can try that and fail on so many levels because you can be like, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll try we'll try and do a couple of blues songs and fail okay well let's let's do some uh gospel and we'll fail or it's just not it's not as good as it can be but this the execution of all of them were just stunning yeah it's interesting isn't it 
Because when you mention like one song is Motown, the other song is blues, etc. But in the end, all those elements are in pretty much every song. You just have yeah. something that stands out. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So they have all that um, mix of different genres in, in, in every song. I can, I can find rhythm and blues, traditional blues, and rock and roll in literally every song they do. Yeah. And there's a bit of like, uh, uh, one of the most interesting ones for me is I'm crying because it's a Latin groove. Sounds like a variation of a rumba. It's okay. not like, not quite like the Americans used to do blues rumbas, but similar, right? And it's a cool one because you have the, the drums doing that kind of rumba groove, and the keyboard uh, the, it, it's just playing a very, very percussive feel yeah. on top of it. It feels more like a percussion instrument than keyboards. It's really rhythmic, and it's really like kind of uh, uh, reinforcing whatever the drums are doing. So that that's a... And there's loads of vocal harmonies which you can associate with maybe you know um, the Beatles or or, mm. or or whatever early stuff you can think about. But you have mm. those vocal harmonies plus Latin vibes on the groove, plus really strong keyboards on it. It's it's really cool. It's a really cool combination. Do you know the the song Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs? Yes, yes, that reminded me of that one. I'm crying, Ooh. really reminded me of that, guys. As usual, any song we mention here is going to be in the playlist at the bottom of the show notes whilst you're listening, so go and check that out. Um, but yeah, I thought the, the thing is, like you said, that rhythmic percussive element to that organ and the keyboard, and I thought that actually one of the defining features throughout all the songs that actually I would consider and say is the, the 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 factor that could change it from sounding bluesy or to Motown or to R&B was the keyboard. Because the organ that's going on throughout all of the songs is just brilliant. I mean, the keyboard player is just fantastic. What was his name? Alan Price. Alan Price, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, so here's the thing. I actually think he is the, um, well, that's it might be controversial, but I think he's the most important member of the band in that sense in terms I of agree. defining their sound uh okay. obviously the vocals are, are really recognizable but the keyboards i think they knew that the organ vibe they had in their songs was so different and so uh relevant to to their song to their music yeah that they made it um intentionally louder than everything else uh on the mix it stands it can, up doesn't it the, it is it, just like literally way louder than any other instruments in any song pretty much you know uh um that like uh uh house of the rising sun obviously it's it's a classic case of that you can you can hear uh the one i mentioned i'm crying um it's it's another song that the, the keyboards are really really loud um but then don't but then, let me be misunderstood it's yeah the, the keyboards are also like it is it's, I think the keyboards are more essential to the riff in that song than the guitar is. Yeah. But then songs like Take It Easy, that he, he changes the sound from being a keyboard organ sound to a piano, and it just sounds like good old rock and roll piano. Exactly. That song that song is, is, is a, like a, a, a very um, a, a clear Texas shuffle. Um, it's, a, it's a Texas shuffle. It's classic blues for me. Yeah. And um, yeah, and and it, it's let me let me say a couple of things about that song. Why I like it so much because when I say it's a Texas shuffle, is is that that kind of blues groove that um, that you can hear in in many many classical blues songs with lots of stops and obviously the, the turn around the chord progression at the end of the uh, of the chorus of each time you, you go through the structure, but it's not a blues in the sense of suffering in the sense of those lyrics about like something negative yeah. that's a song about come on if you you know if you take a time if you if you act in a cool way then i'll be nice to you too it's 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 a, it's a really interesting kind of positive uh um message on the lyrics and it's 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 a happy song for me yeah. for for some that's, that's got blues instrumentation but uh and and again yeah you you got like keyboard solo and guitar solo so it's another song that shows that the keyboards are at least as important as the guitar but in most songs i think it's even more important 
Yeah, no, I agree, man. Um, and I just think, like I said earlier, the variety of, of sounds that he produces from his keyboard, sometimes it's a piano sound, other times it's an organ sound, and that just lends itself to the to the stylistic differences that they're presenting. Um, now, the one thing I did find that people did have to say about the animals, and this is what I was saying, is that... They, they they were at their peak whilst the Beatles were at their peak. So it's kind of like it's you're never gonna how win. Come? <laughs> so, say again? Yeah, no, how come? How come you get to that point when the Beatles are there? Well, do you yeah. want to know my thing? Again, you know what I do. I write my things and I write my end summary of what I'm gonna say at the end, but actually, you know, it always comes around earlier. What I found interesting is that so do you know what? It's it's early in the episode, but who cares? Um, this this was going to be my summary at the end, but it fits now. So this is what I've written. Um, in terms of what the band, the animals represented, it seems to me that the animals were the last cover pop bands of the British pop scene in the sixties. Now, what I mean by that, for those that don't know, is the animals barely wrote any of their songs. Now, in yeah. the first two albums, I think there is one song written by them. And in the second album, there's like three, four of them. But they're, they're, they're a cover band. They're covering the old R&B tunes um, from America. They're covering um, the bl American blues. Uh, yeah. And the reason for that was their, was their manager, Mickey Most, um, who actually encouraged them to keep up with the times, listen to the American folk and blues standards, learn them, put them on your next album and everything. And he was the one that encouraged them to do that. And my thinking with that is that the Beatles were a skiffle band as well, weren't they? So they were doing those covers as well. They were hearing what these American blues musicians were bringing over and they were covering them as the Quarrymen. Now, my the interesting part is that, for me, if there is said to be a failure of the animals in terms of advancing their music and their... I don't know, their renown, then for me it's because they stayed so stereotypical to the genres they were covering. And whilst we just identified three or four songs, and I'm sure we'll talk about more, of how great this tune is as a blues, how great this tune is as a Motown song, how great this is as a rock song, they didn't vary it up enough or change enough to sort of stand out. And at the same time that you've got the animals doing these covers, you've got the Beatles pioneering genres and inventing, you know, styles and yeah. sitars on their pop music, you know. So it's like the animals, I feel, I feel that they were the last... Sorry, I know you want to say something. I'll just finish by saying that... Yeah. That they were the. It seems to me that that transition from when British pop went from covering American pop slash blues slash R and B to becoming original British pop, those two feels to me like the Animals were the last ones and the Beatles were the new ones. Does that make sense? Do you agree? That do you makes, agree? Yeah, it, it does make sense, especially because they started. It kind of started at the same time as the Beatles, yeah, yeah, 63, when the Beatles actually released the first album, I think it's the exact same year, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. No, you are right. Uh, but yes, but they were, isn't it important to have bands that are constantly innovating, but also important to have bands that are going to stick to their roots and preserve yeah. uh, uh, some of those genres? You don't, want, you don't want that kind of music to die. And if you still have someone recording and performing that, those things... Uh, with some sort of fidelity to to the original uh, versions, then I think you 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 you're doing a, a great service to the music industry, and I think that's yeah. what they did. Well, you're right. Uh, Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah. So some some people would argue they're not a rock band because they you know, uh, but I mean they they could be rhythm and blues or folk or, or pop. This but, is but it's still that's rock. Yeah, know? it's like that. That's just. If you if you're if you're if you're a if you're a modern band in the '60s and you're using electric guitars, electric bass, mic'd up drum kits, you're shouting into your microphone. Then, <laughs> if if you, if you're not gonna go all out and out and say right, we're an R and B band, or we're a blues band, or we're a rock and roll band, then why then rock is perfect, isn't it? That's the perfect way to describe it. Exactly, it is. Yeah, it is. Because again, musical freedom. You can yeah. do whatever you want. And in, in and, response. Uh, Sorry, I was going to say, in response to what you were saying about the, uh, whilst it's important to have bands innovating and pioneering, but also bands sticking to the roots, I'm thinking that, imagine if you're a guy in the 60s and you don't want to hear the Beatles put sitar on the new album, <laughs> then you're going to go listen to the animals. 
<laughs> you've enjoyed your traditional yeah, you've, yeah. you've enjoyed your traditional American blues, you've enjoyed your traditional R and B and British pop. Why are these guys putting sitars and shouting Revolution Nine, Revolution yes. Nine? Well, I just want to hear my classic blues. So you'd go and listen to the animals, wouldn't you? I get it, yeah. It's just like some people don't want to sit on on, on weather spoons and order from the app. They you want to go all the way to the bar. It's like, let me do it the traditional way <laughs> and pay cash. <laughs> so is that what we're saying? The animals are the guy who goes up to the bar and pays with cash, and the beetles are the people who stay at their table, order from the app using their Monzo debit card, right? Exactly. <laughs> because they, they, the Beatles managed to keep up with the times, yeah. whilst the animals, oh, they were goodness. kind of just trying to preserve what they first done on, on the very yeah. first album, isn't it? Brilliant. Well, one, one interesting thing about that is, like, the um, um, they were part of what the Americans considered the British invasion. Yes. They were, they were a big part of that group of British bands that actually made their way into the American charts. And um, obviously they had this like massive number one hit. So it's a number one, I think, all over the world with uh, House of the Rising Sun. Yeah. And so but the interesting thing is, uh, I believe none of those British bands could actually play the blues like the Americans could. Okay. And that's why they are interesting, because they were doing, they were taking that uh, uh, American, I said blues, but it's also folk. Or Motown, they were taking those influences and doing their own way. Can you, and can then you, the Americans um, were impressed by that. Oh, wait, right. wait a minute, that's our music, but it's not quite the same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can and can you, you give us a musical um, example uh, of what you think the British bands have done differently to America? Are, are you talking musically in terms of rhythms? And, I, I, think, and I think it's the arrangements more than anything else. I mean, obviously, some things are more subtle, like how you rhythmically approach a shuffle or a straight groove, like rock and roll. But I think uh, um, every culture, pe people just play things in, in their own way. You know, I mean, like if if you start the bossa nova band in America, it's not going to be like Brazilian bossa nova. If you start, you know, it's just it's just what it is. Like Frank Sinatra singing Tom Jobim songs, it's 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 just his own take. It's not you can't say it's bad. It's, yeah, it's, it's actually genius. It's amazing, and yeah. you, you can say the same about British playing of uh, uh, blues and uh, rhythm blues and folk. So basically, it's like, well, we're going to do it based on what um, I don't know, based on our background. I, I don't know how people came up with the main differences, but I would say that the guitars are more aggressive in general. Um, there's a stronger presence of keyboards, which we've said a million times already in this episode, but this mm. is specifically with the animals is what you have. And I think it did help them to break into America. Now, there's an interesting story about that. One American that knew how to do uh, uh, American music in a British way was Jimi Hendrix, right? So yeah. that's why Jimi Hendrix experienced as a British band. And uh, his manager in the UK, the guy who actually helped him to come to the UK was the Animals bass player. So Charles Chandler, so he, he was the guy who brought uh, Hendrix to the UK. And uh, basically he was one of the main uh, um, names like who, who are responsible for, for Hendrix's success. So, so that's, that's what I think the animals, they've got such an immense legacy for, for British music and for... More than just musical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The musical, the, the bass player bringing Hendrix over to England. <laughs> like so, yeah, so basically, in itself. One, yeah, one of the animals is responsible for the, the very existence of Jimi Hendrix's experience, which is one of the most influential bands of all time. Yeah. So think about that. And Hendrix oh. was doing something similar to what they were doing, is yeah. play American music in an European or British way. So no, that, right. that, that, that's, that's just, like, amazing. There's another thing I want to say, which has to do with, with their legacy, is well the first uh, the first single they released. I want to just confirm the original name because they released a um, "Baby, Let Me Take You Home," yeah, which was a similar to a version that Bob Dylan did of a song. There is actually called "Baby, Let Me Follow You Down." Yes, you're right. No, you're right. Yes, I, read, exactly. I read that as well. "Baby, Let Me Follow You Down." Yes, that's the original name. So uh, Dylan changed some of the lyrics and and the title of the song. Uh, and made it his own, right? So yeah. they recorded with Dylan's songs, or Dylan, sorry, Dylan's uh, lyrics, but 
they've changed the arrangements, obviously. So it's not folk anymore, it's electric folk. And by doing that, they've influenced Dylan to change his sound from acoustic uh, to electric. Wow. So he heard their version of his cover. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even the original song. Oh, and he thought, wow, do you know what? I, I need to go down that route. I want to do it. And I want to go electric. That's and, and, yeah. and for listeners, you'll know that you know the, his backing band was the band who we did an episode on a few months ago. Um, so yeah, that, that's the moment. Wow, incredible! Uh, that, song, you, that song, that song, songs on the last words. Um, yes, with Dylan and the band. So check it out. Oh, that's it. That song's really good, though. I like that one because, like I said, when I did the song name and the genre that I associated with it, there were only a few um, that I actually classed as pop. And this was one of them. I feel it really gave me a strong Beatles vibe. What was it? Baby, let me take you home, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it reminded Baby, me. Baby, let me take you home, or originally called Baby, let me follow you down. So you yeah. can find this song in many different versions under these two names. It reminded me of I'm Happy Just to Dance with You by the Beatles, actually. It just had this oh, right. ugly, really easygoing stuff, didn't it? Um, do you know, talking yeah. of the pop, um, another big influence that I heard in several of these songs was actually uh, the Rolling Stones. Yeah. This song specifically, the one I just mentioned, the, the, the groove sounds a lot like Satisfaction. I don't know which one came first. Uh, it's the same sort of just a steady snare groove which is yeah. a kind of a motown vibe as well the one that i heard the one that did um rolling stones for me was we've got to get out of this place that one mm. it had a motown kind of driving drum beat with the bass line going on underneath and it's a bass intro isn't it yeah exactly yeah but in the end you know when you hear the lyrics and the chorus and the energy that eric burden brings to it it's just a rock song isn't it it's like yeah that's that's an interesting point although they have different uh you know the the vocals are not the same. It's not the same tone in the voice, but he is his interpretation sometimes sounds sounds a bit Mick Jagger for me. Yeah, it, it does. Because yeah. a bit bit of spoken vocals from time to time, and a bit of like conversational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conversational. That's it. That, that yeah. song we got to get out of this place is actually very interesting because it's it's one of it's one of a wave of songs that were first identified with music being a force for like social consciousness and, and social revolution, you know, along with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan. Um, it was actually, I don't know if you know this, it was, this is a British band and we know that they went to America to, to bring their American, their, their British copied American blues over to America. Um, yeah. Uh, but this, this was huge in America. And do you know why? No. Because of Vietnam, we, we've got to get out of this place. And it was said, I was, re I was reading that if you were an American, um, what should we call them, a function band, going around and playing at the army bases, this song was shouted at you, as in, as in please play it. So yeah. we've got to get out of this place by the animals was actually one of the Vietnam anthems in the early stages. Because, you know, Vietnam War lasted for, well... Um, we spoke about Vietnam earlier, myself and Felipe. Yeah. Quite interested in the history of it, but um, yeah, whilst the Vietnam War technically started in eighteen fifty eight, the the official war started at sixty five or uh, sixty four and went on to seventy five. So you got the animals doing their thing and releasing songs that we gotta get out of this place, and the Americans took it because that's what the Americans were feeling at that time. We got to get out of Vietnam. Yeah, loads of people were, yeah, loads of people were just unhappy with the the, the endless war, just like take yeah. take all soldiers you know, uh, I just out of that war and bring them crazy. back home. Yeah, yeah exactly. I just found it crazy that you've got this British pop band leading an American charge of get our troops out of Vietnam. You know, it's crazy. But again, music transcends countries, doesn't it? It transcends exactly. nationality. And the way you interpret a song, uh, the, the energy you bring to a song, uh, it, it can be perceived in a different, different way by the audience, right? Sometimes yeah. you mean something with lyrics and melodies, but people are going to hear it in another way. They're going to give another meaning or add layers of meaning straight to whatever you wanted to say originally yeah so it's um yeah it's quite interesting and uh, and um yeah well another another important part of their legacy it's incredible like the the, the more you keep digging <laughs> the more interesting yeah. stuff you find about the animals what an important <laughs> band like it, it's yeah it's amazing man one thing i want to say is the other day I was watching um Brian May, I think, was on his Instagram, whatever, 
and he was breaking down the riff of House of Rising Sun. So it was like oh, wow. uh, teaching people how to play because he usually teaches his riffs on his social media. Oh, this, you know, uh, some of Queen's songs, and he was showing that one and explaining why that was such a crucial riff for the time and how you know it's just a simple thing played on the guitar, but yeah. it does put the guitar that song you have the guitar leading the song, but as soon as the keyboards come in, they they take over. Yeah, and uh, for me, it, the animals is all about guitar and keyboards all, all the way, even though there's like great uh, rhythm rhythmic session session. So but you, you'll know. Uh, yeah. But it's it's just like the the the, the guitar and keyboards are um, definitely leading the band in most cases, and 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 the riffs are fabulous. And it, that's again the consistency is amazing. Every song by the animals that you listen to, you're going to find those elements. Is there any songs you want to talk about, man? Because I, well, I, I talk, we're talking about, you know, loads of, like, um, uh, uh, elements that you can actually find in every song. But yeah. what can well, you say sp- specifically? Let's let's do, we're going to do a segment in a minute where myself and Felipe yeah. choose our top five songs. But before we do that, I just want, there is a few I want to mention, only because what I really want you guys to get from this is what myself and Felipe hear in these songs. So there's a few songs from this singles album where I have made notes of what it sounds like to me. And then, so I'm going to tell you the song, the animal song, what I hear, why I hear it. And then I'll put it in the playlist. So for example, the, um, the song for Miss Corker, it's just a slow blues, but it really reminded me of Fats Domino. Um, Alan Price on keyboard playing that kind of, jazzy blues hybrid um these little piano keys just doing tinkling away and little embellishments it's not like a main melody it's just little parts he does at the end of every phrase so really reminded me of blueberry hill by fats domino um the song she said yeah that for me that was just an out and out rock, out and out rock and roll song um and you know there's lots of characteristics in it you've got the walking bass i think going the doom do 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 like that um stops as well i can't remember i think is it she said yeah 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 or something like that that's very characteristic of rock and roll so again you know i'm thinking um bill haley rock around the clock jerry lee lewis great balls of fire you, these just have all the key elements of that sort of stereotypical rock and roll um Another one, uh, Bright Lights, Big City. It reminded me of Kansas City, Hey, Hey, Hey by the Beatles. Just the yeah, way, you got and that's that the way they gift. do it, because the original one uh, by Jimmy Reed is completely different. Uh, and it's, of Bright Lights, Big City. Yeah, if we can have that on the playlist. Yeah, absolutely. Just, uh, they even actually added some lyrics at the end, but basically uh, that one, if if you don't mind me stepping in, uh, no, that no, one... No. Uh, um, the original Jimmy Reed song is straightforward blues. It's okay. shuffle and the focus is on the melody and the lyrics. And you've got to consider that that, that recording was so old and the, the, the technology available was like not, not as good as what the animals had access to, I would say. So the recording is really poor. So it's okay. all about how good the lyrics and the melody are. So if you listen to Jimmy Reed playing that song, it's beautiful. And then how can you make it as good as that one? How can you make it even better? And I think they've managed to make it better by doing, adding tempo changes in the song. So the chorus and, and the verse have different tempos, which yeah. you usually don't have in traditional blues. And they have their own riff in the song. And the vocal approach, again, is that's where rock and roll comes in because it's rock. Yeah, That vocal approach is not traditional. That's rock. That's very modern for the time. And uh, but it's still paying tribute to their heroes, right? Musical uh, freedom, yeah, musical freedom. They're taking the aspects and elements of a song they love and they're turning into their own. You know, little yeah. musical freedom. Um, just to, I've only got a few more left of my little co- comparisons. Um, the song I can't believe it. I mean, that for me is just so R and B. It's just so 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 R and B. And funnily enough, the two songs that I've um, uh, sort of associated with it. A two female R and B singers. Song one, "At Last" by Etta James, and mm. song two, "Pain in My Heart" by Helene Smith. These will all be in the playlist, guys. And I just there's elements I hear in certain um, in certain songs by the Animals, and maybe it's the the arpeggiated guitar going, you know, dun 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 dun, dun, dun you know, the six eight feel going. Yeah. But that was really strong for me. That that for me, I can't believe it was the most R and B 
or American R&B, I should say, um, influence that I heard on the album. And it was accomplished stunningly. And it wasn't like, it wasn't second rate R&B. It wasn't, oh, the Brits do crap R&B. It was good. <laughs> no, they, that's the thing, they, uh We've got to mention that they're all really good musicians, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Solid playing in all albums. You, you got to remember, like nowadays, people record with click tracks, which is basically a metronome keeping time. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a click that keeps the musician in time. And if you don't play time, you just go on a computer and fix it. Yeah. Those guys, they were just playing live in the studio, playing together. And you see how, how steady the tempo is and how consistent the grooves are, the, the bass lines. You know? So it's they are actually playing things that sound simple, but they're not that easy to execute. So you've got to be a real musician to, to play yeah. like them. So right. I think that's really cool stuff there. What's cool about that is um, I love that aspect of live, of, of recording music, because... Yeah. I love hearing the mistakes. I don't care. I love it. In <laughs> in Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, there's I think it's during the lyric, there's a feeling I get. One of the guitar notes, he plays Jimmy Page plays a bum note. It's like the there's a dun 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 dun. And it's but just it's there. I love it. They they didn't get rid of it. Why would you? That's part of the character of the song. And I think I hear a bit in House of the Rising Sun as well. I think it's one of the first bars of the guitar. And he's like he's a little late. He's like just a little timing issue. No one cares, but that's character, man, isn't it? That's character. Yeah. Exactly. Um, because if you if you can, you know, uh uh Imagine you record in the studio like with your bandmates and you do something slightly off and you're like, I don't want to stop because you know I'm gonna mess up with everyone's hard work. You know what I mean? Like every, everyone is doing their best and you're doing your best. You do something wrong, just keep going. So it's like some very subtle mistakes you might find in those recordings, but uh they are really rare and when they happen they don't actually affect the song in a negative way at all. Yeah, That's proof right. how good they are musically and how uh, uh, consistent they are with their playing uh, and it's it's just like really really solid mm-hmm. really good anyway the final song uh, that i wanted to talk about was gonna send you back to walker which i heard serious credence clearwater revival influences in this <laughs> one and i've actually um n- um identified the song cross tie walker by credence and i really hear elements of that song in gonna send you back to walker but that's it for which me one came first i haven't i didn't i don't know i, I just Oh, I'd assume it was the animals. Yeah, probably. I'd assume it was the animals. Yeah, but actually, I don't know if this was on their third album or their fourth. You know, who knows? But I'll have a look at that. Um, but yeah, anyway, guys, thanks for listening to me tell you songs I thought these songs sounded like. I just felt that it was quite important just hearing this this huge spread of these genres that they've done all within their their own music, which is labelled as British pop, and yet we're British pop. American, American <laughs> R and B, American blues. Um, you know the doo wop, Motown. It's just fantastic stuff. But... Yeah, I think I think this uh, uh, again, as I say, as I said before, that their legacy is so uh, um, amazing, and it, 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 and sometimes it's they were one, one of those bands that I, I sometimes even forget they exist. Like you think yeah. about you think about Hendrix, and you wouldn't think about the relation he has with with the Animals. And Slade was another band managed by their bass player. Really? So, yeah. Yes. Charles oh, Chandler oh, also definitely. managed Slade, so you got Slade and, and Hendrix experience uh, uh, somehow related to the animals. Um, uh, the, the, one of the first songs I've I've, I've listened that that was uh, previously recorded by the animals was uh, "Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood." Oh, yeah. um, uh, again, it's not they didn't write the song, right? But it was, it was popularized uh, by Nina Simone. Nina Simone, which is exactly. jazz. So, jazz, which was a huge, yeah, huge influence for them. But I've they made it rock and roll. They turned that song into a rock song. And then I've listened. I've first heard that song uh, played by Gary Moore. Okay, and and it's heavy and it's really heavy, uh, and it's really cool. You know, it's like proper blues rock. But the animals, the way they play it, uh, again, you have the keyboards leading, but you have that really strong vocal. Uh, during the chorus, that is, it, it, it stands out, makes the chorus the most uh, uh, um, important part of the song for real. Yeah. Doesn't make it like, come on, guys, this is the chorus. And um, <laughs> there's 
a very clever use of silence. There's loads of spaces between the riffs. And, and, and that's one of the things that, that builds up the anticipation for, for the chorus. I love that. I just love the way they think about arrangements and spaces and, and textures. They, they, they're great. But you know me. You, I, I don't know if I, I'm not going to put this in the quiz because I don't know if you'd get the answer. But oh. for anyone who knows me and my musical personality, my favorite quote about music is it's not about the notes you play, it's about the space you leave. And Felipe summed it up perfectly there. Less is more. Sometimes a bar of silence or two beats of silence can say more than any guitar fill, drum fill, or bass lick can do. Yeah. Exactly, and I think this is this this is uh, um, one of the key elements of the animals. Yeah, that we're really no, you're right. Uh, using the spaces and the silence. Yeah, um, right. So talking about sort of the timeline of the animals, there's actually it's it's so short, and that's what surprised me yeah. most, man. It was just 1963 to 1969, and in the middle of that, and I, that's what it is. Yeah, much. and I think in the middle of that, in '66. Um, that's when they became Eric Burdon and the Animals. So even there was a little change there. And then they are still touring now, uh, 1992 to present. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure actually if any of the original mem members are still touring that. Um, but technically, they're still going. Yeah, and I think we talked about that when we were, talk we were doing the episode about Yes. And yeah. I, think, uh, um, I think rock bands, if they could last forever, why not? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Why the hell? Again, not? If, you, if you think if you think they're not the original, you don't want to listen to them. Just don't go to the show. But I I, I find it amazing that you can preserve the brand, you know, mm. and 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 carry on. Which I I've, I've heard Kiss is doing. They're gonna they gonna keep touring as Kiss, but with none of the original members. And I think why not? You know, like if if the fans want to want to buy the tickets and see. Uh, uh, someone representing uh, that band is what orchestras do, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's what, right. So why, why not? So I think rock and roll is becoming classical music in a certain way. Uh, or, well, you know. it, it's certainly the historical impact that rock and roll as a huge genre, and we don't just mean Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis, we mean all the bands rock. we've spoken about here. Yeah, rock, rock and roll. It's now becoming an important part of history because music is changing. And we know now that modern pop music today, um, for example, is very electronic, very keyboard and synth led. I'm not by any means saying rock is dying or rock and roll is dead. That's a whole, we got I'm sure there's another five episodes we can do on that. But it's kind of like now we have the moment where rock and roll and rock had its time. 1960s, probably through to 2010. And again, this isn't saying rock is dead. I'm just saying that, you know, you think of pop rock, popular rock, Nickelback. That was that was famous in the early 2000s. Yeah. That was pop yeah. music. Nickelback were pop music in the Pop early music, yeah. yeah. Now yeah. pop has changed so drastically that I think rock has had its historical time. Again, I'm not yeah. saying it's dead. I'm not saying it's over. I'm not saying there's not more to come. But it's, it's, in terms of its place in history. It's the one music style that incorporated... Uh, pretty much everything that existed before, isn't it? That's what. Yeah. Uh, that's what we said about Elvis' uh, first album. You did. He yeah. had everything that has been done in American music before that album, and I think the Animals were doing the same thing in a British way. Yeah. Just like no, Elvis, right they now. took everything that existed before them and put it all together, uh, um, you know, in their own way, without that's without that. trying necessarily to sound exactly like their idols. That's actually a comparison I hadn't thought of, but you, you, you've you hit the nail on the head there. They have done what Elvis did with that first album. Um, but yeah, anyway, right, time for a segment. Um, it's, time yeah. for, it's time for Laz to give Felipe a quiz. Oh, my God. <laughs> right, I'm not, I'm not prepared. Let's see. I know you're going to get one right. Okay, you'll find out when. <laughs> okay. Right. Question uh, one out of four. I've got for you. Okay. Actually, do you know what? I'll give you the one I know you're going to get now. Chaz Chandler's fame came from another musical achievement. What was it? Well, to manage Jimi Hendrix's experience and discover him. Yeah, yeah. Well done. One. You got one. Well, well done. For, yeah, you got one again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got one right. Can I? Yeah. Can I? Can I leave uh, another? Right. Question two. 
Which famous rock guitarist joined Eric Burden and the Animals in 1968? Is it Andy Summers? Yes, well done, from the police. Yeah, well done. <laughs> um, question three. Musical differences, personal differences, and what other reason was responsible for Alan Price leaving the band? Ooh, so you've got three reasons. No? Okay, so musical differences, personal differences, and fear of flying. He hated being on really? the He hated getting the airplane. <laughs> so those three reasons were why he was quit. <laughs> Probably flying is, is the biggest one. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I, I, I'd love to know his thing. Was it like 30, 30, and 40? Or <laughs> was it, you know, 190 flying, 5% musical, 5% personal? Well, flying, um, flying can be more scary than someone playing. Oh, for some people, exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, right, final question. Which country did the band have to flee from under threat of death in September 1968? Wow. I couldn't possibly... Let me try to just guess, because I never, okay. never heard of that. Ah, uh, God, I have no idea. Let me think. I don't know. I'm not going to guess. Right. No idea. There's a story behind this, and it's bloody brilliant. Um, let me just find where I made it on my notes. Um... Right now, this the funny thing is that the answer I'm going to give you is the reason that the band broke up because this event, everyone was like, no fuck it, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> in 1968, in Japan, the tour was delayed by two months due to visa issues. So the promoters, who turns out were members of the Yakuza, kidnapped. <laughs> kidnapped the animal's manager and made him write an IOU for $25,000 to the Yakuza for the costs they'd lost, for the, for the costs they'd incurred through the two months delay. Can you believe that? Right, and, and it doesn't end there. The manager wrote out an IOU $25,000, but because the, the, the his kidnappers were Japanese, they couldn't read English, and he wrote underneath, I wrote this under duress, which means which means he, that IOU wasn't valid because he yes. had written someone made me write this. So I owe you twenty five thousand Yakuza. Hey, listen, anyone who sees this note, I did this under duress. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they didn't have to. Um, so they didn't have to pay anything later. But anyway, so they managed to get away with it. But well, they... then he he did the note. He said, right, here's your IOU, and the yakuza are like, right, fine. You know, oh, next time you come, you pay us. He let them go, and he said, but you and the band, you've got to leave tonight. And they left. They fled from Japan, 1968. Without actually playing at all. Uh, I don't know, but I'd assume yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a story? Is that not rock and roll? <laughs> right, quick, I'm not I'm putting in a new segment. I'm, I'm putting in the same segment. How rock and roll is that? Let oh. me think. Let me go. That is well. Wow, that's 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 got to be a high number, man. I'll give it. Oh, man, I'll give it 82. 82, that's <laughs> more than fair. So for anyone, yeah, so 82 out of 100 for how rock and roll Play in Japan that. because you got in trouble with the Yakuza. That's like, <laughs> it doesn't get much more rock and roll than that. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, anyway, that's the end of the quiz. Well done, Felipe. You got, what, um, two got out two. more. So well done. Another good one. Um Excellent. So, uh, well, actually, we've got another one, another segment, which we can do now, which I suppose is appropriate. Yeah. And um, we're going to do Laz and Felipe's top five. <music> Our top five animal songs. Now, I'm going to... Uh, little um, disclaimer is that they are from this Singles Plus album, but I don't think it matters because this is a nice, broad spectrum of what the animals gave us throughout their career um so felipe what's your fifth favorite animal song and why take it easy okay. just because that's the most bluesy one really and i like uh as i said before as a kind of texas shuffle vibe it's very american in a certain way but i like the lyrics i think it's 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 um uplifting in a certain way for for a bluesy song Lovely. I love that. Um, and you're number five. 
my number five is we got to get out of this place. Um, I, I love mm-hmm. the song. I think it's really nice. Like that chorus is just so Motowny, but with hints of British pop, with the Rolling Stones, with the Beatles. You know, it's got everything. But I did love that it was one of the first wave of songs that were actually sort of. Um, showing the public that, listen, we can talk about politics in music. We can um, bring about social consciousness to the public. You know, I like that. And um, the fact, again, the fact that a a British band's song became an anthem of an American war, I found, I don't want to say fun because they weren't singing, the Americans weren't singing, we've got to get out of this place for having a fun time. But that's an animal's legacy. That's another legacy point that we can say. That is really, really amazing. Um, so what is your fourth favourite song? My number four is uh, Baby Let Me Take You Home. Okay. is Because, you know, it's the song that actually probably introduced them to uh, their first fans. And the fact that they've, through the, they've managed to reinvent Bob Dylan through that song and they actually managed to make Bob Dylan f- rethink the, his approach to folk, like, <laughs> come on, it's, it's, it's your hero, life, basically. It's your hero listening to you, thinking, "Wow, I want to sound like those guys." So yeah. that's that's why it's my number four. So you could say the animals made Bob Dylan rethink his life. <laughs> yes, his life. <laughs> well, yeah, well, his life work had been folk yeah. music just today. Wanna, just, yeah, two elements about that song that I, I want to emphasize again: it's like the really loud organ in the mix, and at the very end of the song, they do a double tempo thing. They just <laughs> when you think there's nothing you're coming up to just double the tempo brilliant yeah. oh brilliant um well my fourth favorite song is i can't believe it um again i said i said i gave you the two songs earlier that i thought it reminded me of i just love that gospel feel it has because i think gospel music is so traditionally and rightly so associated with americans or even black american culture that we were su- not surprised but we were um Okay, surprise. We we were surprised when we were hearing that Elvis was taking so many of these gospel influences, and he was a white American. So for a white British band to take so much em- uh, influence from Black American music like the gospel, I just and I, I thought it wasn't it wasn't shit. It wasn't like no. really badly done gospel. And again, listen, it's not an out and out gospel song, but you can so hear the influences in it. And I just think it was a really yeah. Uh, I think it's a cover. Um, oh no, I can't believe it actually might might have been one of theirs. But anyway, it's the gospel and R and B influence that I loved on that one. Um down to the top three. What was your third favorite animals song? Well, House of the Rising Sun. Yeah. Um I think it's it's about it's, my favorite thing about that song is the lyrics are so dark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. And it's a number one international hit. Yeah. Usually, number one hits are silly songs about love. So, so we talked a lot about the, instru- the instrumental parts of this, those songs. M- my personal reason for House of the Rising Sun to to be number three is because they they managed to um, recreate a song, make it more interesting, and actually make the lyrics sound darker. Because mm. of their arrangements and because yeah. of the vocal approach, I think the original was is it was it Lead Belly did the original. I uh, don't know. I, I don't know. Who's the Listen, original. I will, guys, listeners, I will put the effort in, and if I I'll do my research, and whatever songs on this album are a cover, I will try and find the original for you. Okay, so I'm going to put the whole of this Animals album in. And on the playlist, if you what's number one, uh, baby, let me take you home. Then I'll put the Dylan one. Then we'll do gonna send you back to Walker. And if that's a cover, then I'll find the original. Okay, so I'll do my best. I'll try and find the originals for you, just so you can hear, hear what the animals heard first, and then how they yeah. made it home. Um, and this and this is an important yeah. part of what we do, I guess, because we're not we're not here claiming to be experts in any of those bands. We research and we're finding, you know. Uh, finding our, our own reasons for for enjoying that kind of yeah. music, and uh, we're trying to to learn as we go once we do the show. So sometimes that's, we we, that's we been... find some stuff like where this what where does this come from? Maybe if, you know whoever's listening to this, if you if you know any interesting thing about the animals that we didn't mention, just let us know. Yeah, absolutely. We want to, we um, want to learn. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um. My, so anyway, my third favorite song, "It's My Life." 
um, and it wasn't written oh, by right. them. Um, I found it really Rolling Stonesy. Uh, the guitar riffs and melodies that were quite prominent. You know, if you listen to the, the the blues songs, the guitar is not playing a riff or a repeated melody. It's kind of just doing blues embellishments. Maybe it's playing chords. Um, this to me was a very early example of like what the Rolling Stones used to do. I mean, you know, songs like Satisfaction, where the guitar was the lead instrument. And the other thing I found interesting was the lyrics, rebellious lyrics. It's my life and I'll do what I want. It's my mind and I'll think what I want. Like mid 60s and you've got this British band telling you, hold on, don't listen to everything you say. And I'm not going to do everything you tell me to do. I'm my own person. I'll do what I want and I'll think how I want. I just thought that quite interesting for the 60s. It's the kind of lyrics that sounds like uh, someone just, you know, raising the middle finger, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what is your second favourite animal song? Uh, my number two is going to be I'm Crying for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, Latin groove, the percussive approach on keyboards and the vocal harmonies. Those are good Lovely. reasons for listening to that song. Beautiful song. Um, fantastic. Yeah, my second favourite song is Bury My Body, which, um, I, I again, I just love it for the gospelness. That they they really took me when I when I hit this when I hit play on this album, I knew what I was expecting with House of the Rising Sun, and I'd heard Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. So I kind of had this musical oral picture in my head or in my ear, whatever, um, of how I, of what their other stuff was gonna sound like. And I was thinking kinks. Beatles, Rolling Stones, that kind of British pop, maybe not as good as the best of the Beatles, you know. But to hear so much R&B and gospel, it really threw me. And as I've said like two or three times before, and as I'll say again, it's not bad gospel. It's not bad R&B. They're doing it very well. Um, so Bury My Body was really good. Really enjoyed that one. It, it reminded me of um, one of Elvis's albums. Um, the album is called His Hand in Mine, which is one of Elvis's later albums. And for those who, who don't know, Elvis's later albums were so heavily gospel um, influenced. Um, so yeah. And sir, what is your favourite animal song? Um, believe me or not, Bright Lights, Big, Big City. Interesting. Um, so okay. Bright Lights Big City is, as I said, yeah, it's a Jimmy Reed song. And the first time I've I've seen this, uh, uh, um, that I've listened to to the animals version of the song, I was like, "How dare you? you know, <laughs> how dare you? Just, just play Jimmy Reed upside down because it's not like it's, it's so different from the original." Okay. It's almost like they only kept the lyrics and not even all the lyrics. Like, right. what are you doing? But isn't this what rock and roll is meant to be? It just it yeah. just challenge yourself to go as far as you can, uh, yeah. uh, exploring the limits of your creativity. And in and, and this specific case of a band, there is essentially, as I said, a covers band, like a band that does versions of uh, uh, other artists' um, uh, catalogue. This was a really, really... Uh, interesting choice and it's a song that I would think twice about covering unless I was doing it similar to the original and I said it before is the tempo changes that make it really special it is the fact yeah. that they, they brought their own riff to the song and and the vocal approach again it's not it's not the same it's, it's much more rock and I think uh, um, to pick such a famous uh, uh, traditional American blues song and make it your own way and do it really well it is a hell of an accomplishment for a band so i love it i think it's really interesting um when we hear bands cover songs by our favorite artists or maybe not not even necessarily but th there are elements in songs where you'd like to hear certain parts of the original so for me i'm just th i'm not going to name any covers because i can't think of them but if I want, if if a band was covering uh, a famous song of another band I like, then if that if the original was famous for for a specific riff, then I'd want to hear that riff in the cover because naturally that's what I think makes the original song special. But it's funny hearing what you said because there's another one. I mean, anyone who looks at the playlist and sees ABBA in are going to be really weirded out without having listened to the episode. Um, but there's a, the ABBA song, SOS. Um, we know it's the, so when you need me, darling, can't you hear? It's very upbeat and it's quite sad, but the, the music's upbeat. It's very poppy. This artist, oh, what is her name? Is it... Um, 
I think it's Portishead, but if I'm wrong, you'll see in the playlist. She does a cover of SOS, and it is slow, like really slow, dark, haunting. There's hardly any instruments in it, from what I remember. I haven't listened to it in a while, but from what I remember, just minimal instruments. And it just, it was one of those where the cover and the original could not be any different. It seems to only be lyrics they share. And I'm just saying that because of what you said about how different the Jimmy Reed one was to this one. Yeah. How it wasn't worse. It was just different. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's just, um, uh, um, yeah, like recreating something without um, without having to sound like a tribute. Yeah, sense. exactly, yeah. And I think that, that sums up who, who they were in terms uh, of, of a band. I'm gonna We're going to recreate stuff, but we don't want to, just sound like someone paying tribute. We're actually turning those songs into our... That's a really good thing, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, to finish then, my favourite song uh, of The Animals is the one that I heard first, which is The House of the Rising Sun. Um, It's a traditional folk standard, so it's not actually their song. Um, I don't think anyone knows who wrote it. Um, But, I mean, I agree with everything Felipe said, but just a few bits for me to add. It's quite obviously, um, with, with the organ and the... I'd say the, the sort of the repetitive guitar. I, I hear a lot of R and B influences in that, but in the drums, I heard a lot of jazz. The t- 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 yeah, there's an interesting thing there. Just on the Sorry, bro. The ride cymbal is louder than the kick and the snare on the mix, or is either the mix or just, just the way the drummer is playing. I, I guess is more like that because they. Yeah. I don't. I don't assume they had one microphone per piece of the drum kit at the time so he's playing the right cymbal louder than the drums in you know, okay. itself so and um, that's a very jazzy approach yeah so interesting but i heard even the rhythms are a bit jazzy as well um yeah. but yeah and then like i said i've been listening to this album for the better part of five days so i've probably heard all these songs a good five times and it was only on it was only on like well, actually one of the later listens that i really paid attention to his vocals and just how kind of I keep saying it, but gospel and preachy his vocals were, especially when he shouted. Um, and it, it, I, I, it t- takes me back to when you see the um, the gospel churches and you hear the preacher sort of shouting, you know, and Lord take you. And he's like, well, it is the rising sun, you know, just the way he's talking at the start and the music builds up and then he punches with those big, you know, those big belting notes at the end. What a like he's getting cover. angrier as the song goes on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And but he's putting this through. Uh, he's putting his yeah. anger through in his vocals and the. the oh, oh, my my wife uses this word all the time. What is it? It's a vocal term. Uh, the the not the belting the the way the way he expresses it. Yeah, you know the way. He's, I don't know the, the technique. <laughs> uh, with drummers and bassists, we don't do it. That's the vocal code. Yeah, uh, but just the way he delivers those big shouted notes are fantastic. So yeah, I mean, what a song and what a cover, right? And and I think it's it's quite appropriate that although we've identified and discussed all these other songs, I'm still I'm not looking and saying, oh, it's a shame that they're not known for. Uh, I can't believe it because that's a great song. I'm happy that they're known for this song because it is a signature song of theirs and deservedly so, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 an amazing song. It's uh, it's not, you know, it's not a surprise that that song was number one. Yeah, still very famous nowadays. Just one more thing to add about their legacy is that actually uh, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994 um, and they've had 10 top 20 hits in both the UK and the US which is interesting wow. because sometimes you normally hear where uh, the band, a British band have uh, t- uh, 10 uh, top 20 UK hits but only 3 in the US because obviously yeah. they're known in their own country, or vice versa. An American band will have uh, five number ones in the US, but then none in the UK, whereas they had an even 10 in, yeah. the, 10 in the UK, oh, which I think is a testament to how brilliantly diverse their music is, because their music is the best of American blues at that time, the best of yeah. American gospel and R&B, and even elements of Motown incorporated with the instrumentation the arrangements, the structures, and the, I think I've said the words, of British pop and rock and roll music. So, yeah, a yeah. fantastic amalgamation of the two cultures, isn't it? 
it is. It's 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 just it's just brilliant how they they put it all together. You know, like mm. um, fantastic. It's just brilliant. Oh. It's just unique for sure. Yeah. Anyway, right. Perfect. I think that's a good place to end it. Um, we've yeah. anything else you want to talk about, or why don't you just give us your summary of the animals? What do you feel about them? What makes them rock and roll? And what are your thoughts coming out of this episode? Wow, tough. I think that the, the uh, biggest contribution is to well, very early in in the history of of British rock, to bring the guitars and the keyboards to to the front, really, and just make it stand yeah, up and a, a yeah. kind of a kind of for for the time very aggressive vocals and completely different I, I think that they they they've recorded songs they didn't write and they've made it so different from the originals without as I said without ruining the songs actually they made most of them better uh, it might be a controversial opinion, but I think they've made them better than the originals. And the fact they've managed to influence not only the next generation of musicians, but some of their own heroes. They, so they've influenced the past and the future. Mm. You don't see too many bands doing that. You know, I mean, a yeah. whole generation of musicians before them was listening to that. So wait a minute, we should do a little bit of what the animals are doing. So yeah, hats off to them. Fantastic stuff. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, and um, I'll just sort of summarise, like I was saying earlier about my thoughts, which is that they were different from the Beatles in that they were not pioneering. They were not looking forward necessarily into what music could be. They weren't using the advanced technological um, attributes that was available to bands like the Beatles at the time. But I don't know if it mattered because you hear character in their music, you hear personality, and you hear well, they, music of not, not yesteryear, yesterday. You know, you're hearing music that's going on in America right now, incorporated into British pop uh, of today in the '60s. Obviously, <laughs> um, did you want to say something? No, yeah, exactly. Because I, I think it's uh, uh, unlike the Beatles and unlike loads of uh, uh, those people who were innovating at the time. They decided to stick to you know, bass, drums, keyboards, guitar, yeah. vocals. Yeah. It's that one thing. Even changing the lineup is that basic uh, rock band lineup, straightforward, uh, bullshit-free rock. I love it. <laughs> the, the only last part I wanted to add was that I, I know I keep going on about this R&B and gospel stuff, but it's only, like, as I said before, it's only because it just took me by surprise. Um, it's easy to see and recognise and hear the blues influence from America in British music, Cream, Clapton stuff, early Sabbath, you know, even early Beatles. Yeah. But I think it's incredibly hard to hear and find the American R&B and gospel influence. You don't, yeah. have, you know what I mean, don't you? The way that the blues from America came over and it hit hard, didn't it? John Mayle and the Blues Breakers, Clapton and Cream, Sabbath, you know, we've just said them all. But there wasn't the same sort of movement that happened with R&B and gospel from America. And there hasn't been since. But I'm still really impressed that the animals were able to take it from America and incorporate it into their music. They, Yeah, they did a fantastic job. It's like... Yeah, and, and it has survived the test of time for sure. You're absolutely right, yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. Yeah, well, fantastic stuff. Um, good place to end it, I think. So um, yeah. once again, guys, thank you very much for, for coming and having a listen to us. Um, Felipe, where can they find us? Uh, well, you guys can find us on the internet. On the internet. So yeah, <laughs> just Google yeah. us and we'll come up. <laughs> yeah, just... Uh, Google it. Yes. Or, or if you listen, if you listen to this um, a thousand years after this recording, Google's not a thing. You just go on the internet. I, I, I imagine the internet was would still be there. Wouldn't that be uh, fun? So, the internet was still there, but Google wasn't. Well, I don't know. You might what if, what if Bing takes over? What? <laughs> what? Bing. You know, Bing is the oh, Bing. Microsoft oh, yeah. version. So Bing it. Google it. Bing it. <laughs> Internet it. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this. And um, keep on rocking, everyone. And as you, you guys, long live rock and roll. Mm -hmm.